So 24 months ago, we at GRASP began a journey. Uh, we're seeking out the best ways to make a more impactful investments in, ca in Canadian ag and environmental sectors. Fast forward to today, and there's been so much change. As we sit here surrounded by some of the greatest champions and leaders in this field, we ask ourselves, what is really going on in this space? Joining us here today to share the current state of Canada's ag tech ecosystem is Sean O'Connor. For those of you who haven't had the pleasure of meeting Sean, Sean O'Connor is the Managing Director for Connexus Venture Capital Inc. and Emertech. Connexus Venture Capital's first fund, the CVC Fund One, is a 2019 vintage and a $32 million fund focused on prairie-based startups. Emetech is the new $60 million early stage Canadian ag tech fund. And so prior to Connexus, Sean was also on the leadership team of Canada's FinTech Grow Technologies Inc, which was acquired by ATB. So without further ado, as he shares with us the state of Canada's ag tech ecosystem, please welcome Sean. Huge thanks to, to Grass and, and RH Accelerator for, for inviting us out here. You know, my, my team, <coughs> last week we were talking about you know, the whole world's opened up again, so now we're, we're traveling out trying to get into different ecosystems and, and attend different events. And there's a, an ag tech event in a couple of months in Toronto, and they're asking if we'd send someone out. And, and I will, I want to support everything ag tech, but I was thinking, why the heck are we talking about ag tech on Bay Street? You know, it needs to be in the heart of Canadian agriculture's ecosystems if we really want to make a change here. So I'm thrilled to, to be out here at, at this event. Thank you very much for having me. I'll be out here a lot too. I'm spending a week out here and about a month and a half touring around with Libro Credit Union as one of our investors. So I would be, be happy to meet with anyone here um, if you'd like when, when that comes as well. But I think that <coughs> you know, I, I came from a FinTech background and I'll give you kind of a quick perspective on that. But we've seen a lot of waves of innovation here in Canada starting with starting with mobile and software, AI, fintech that I was a part of. And, and really they start in all these kind of different pockets and then the anchor ecosystems pick up. And, and I remember when we were building uh, Groupland, which became Grow Technologies back in 2014, a whole bunch of cool fintechs running around Vancouver, neat ones in, in Calgary, you know, Montreal, Ottawa had some sprouting up. And uh, then it was right around kind of 2016 when there was uh, Mars FinTech Accelerator and BDC's uh, FinTech events, really started to say, you know what, heart of FinTech is gonna be here on Bay Street in Toronto, and kind of gobbled everything up. It was a pretty familiar story where you know, a lot of the secondary ecosystems across Canada kind of fight over the crumbs. You know, EgTech's really interesting, where this is our, our first real advantage, where it, it has to be here, like it has to be in, in Guelph, in Regina, in, in Winnipeg, in, in the Okanagan, on Vancouver Island. You know, we've got a really neat opportunity across the country um, to be at the leading edge of this next wave of innovation. And I really think that's exciting for both, both Canada as well as us, you know, secondary tech ecosystems. Um, I'm gonna give you a really quick background on how I got here, because without the context, it seems kind of silly. There's, you know, a FinTech nerd from Vancouver is now running the largest VC fund focused on ag tech in Canada. And I'm gonna say that over and over because Ag Capital Canada will dethrone us in a year or two. <laughs> where we will no longer be the largest. So I figured, well, I can, I'll, I'll continue using that. Um, but you know, my background was, this is initially at Groupland in our you know, tiny little office, and we're missing the spot that would, uh, you know, we had dripping water from the ceiling right behind me. But we, we started this in, in 2014 and, and built up this FinTech company over time that uh, you know, had to pivot and, and change our ways. Um, and, and ultimately we're, were acquired by ATB. I, I left about a year before we were acquired, stayed on as a shareholder and advisor to the company through the acquisition. Um, this, this is my family and I moving out to Regina. As I left Grow, uh, I decided that I wanted to stay in the startup space, but that I needed something that allowed me to be a bit more present. You know, building a startup is a lot of work, it's a lot of hours, both in terms of travel in the office and then just total mindshare as well. And I was looking for a different opportunity that let me stay grounded in the tech space, but, but had a bit more of a, a presence with my family. And uh, we were looking at moving out into the venture capital space in Toronto, and there's a couple opportunities we were looking at. And then one day, this, this kind of neat idea popped up uh, in Saskatchewan. 
uh, with Conexus Credit Union, who's looking to try and catalyze the Saskatchewan tech ecosystem. So I talked it over with, with Eric Dillon, who's the CEO of Conexus at the time, and I thought, you know, this is interesting. And, and I became really kind of enamored with, with the idea of, of what they were building, which I'll talk about in a second. So I went home to my wife and said, honey, how do you feel about moving to Regina? <laughs> She said, I, I honestly, I don't want to move to Manitoba. And I said, okay, you're in luck. We're, we're okay. <laughs> this, this could work then. And yeah, we are, this is us moving from Vancouver to Regina at the Athabasca Glacier on, on the way out there where you know, my wife's followed me into a whole bunch of crazy ideas. And, and this was certainly one of them where we moved out to a, a city that I'd only been to once before, she'd never been to before, and, and didn't know a heck of a lot of people. But you know, the idea behind what got us there was Saskatchewan uh, was a, a wonderful opportunity in uh, the tech ecosystem. I'll try and go quickly over this, but I think it gives kind of a, a background for the way we think about things that connects us venture capital and how do we make money looking where other people aren't. Um, and that was the Saskatchewan tech ecosystem back in, in 2017. There was less than half a percent of all the venture capital in Canada was deployed in Saskatchewan. In, in 2018, same, less than half a percent to $16 million of capital deployed over the entire year. Yeah, we'd created companies like Gas Buddy, Salido, IQ Metrics, Skip the Dishes, Vendasta. We had shown that our founders could outperform and create globally successful technology companies, yet uh, venture capital was literally flying over our heads. So the idea was we can put together this little fund. There's $30 million focused on uh, venture capital or on tech companies in Saskatchewan. It was Conexus Credit Union, a handful of other credit unions in the province, and then a, a little over a dozen high net worth people in, in Saskatchewan who equally understood, you know, our entrepreneurs are great. If you can untie that one arm behind their back, you know, we should be able to, uh, to really drive um, growth in the ecosystem. Um, we had two ideas behind it. One, how do we make our investors a bunch of money? And two, how do we impact the ecosystem? The money part we're still working on, but, but we have a 68.2% IRR. You know, we're, we're performing in the top 1% of 2019 vintage funds in North America. And we've got liquidity events coming out of it. And, you know, cool companies are being born out of there. One of our companies just raised $100 million from SoftBank, a company called Seven Shifts. We had another company raise about $35 million last year called Coconut Software. And we're showing that, you know, when given an equal playing field, Saskatchewan entrepreneurs can, can really outperform. And the other was, oops, what have I done? Sorry, you didn't do anything. Okay. Your it's okay, yeah. So, uh, the idea was, can we make money doing this? And, and we think we're certainly uh, proving that out. And the second one was, you know, can we catalyze the ecosystem? And at the end of 2021, last year, there was $210 million of venture capital deployed in Saskatchewan. It was a long roundabout way of saying, uh, that's how we got started. And when we got started, everyone was reaching out saying, oh, cool, fun based in Saskatchewan, you guys are gonna do ag tech. And, and my view was, why did you hire a fintech nerd to come all the way out here? I'd never seen a combine at the time. Um, but we became I, I, you know, obsessed with the idea of how can you actually create a fund that makes money in the ag tech space? Because there was not a lot of funds at the time. You know, ag Capital Canada wasn't live. We didn't have our fund live. The ones that were up, uh, active in the space, you know, there's, there's challenges that went with it. And ag tech in general was an asset class that hadn't performed particularly well in Canada. And it, the first thing we identified is that too much of the egg tech investments are coming from generalist funds. And it's a totally different playbook in how you invest in an egg tech company compared to a general technology company. I'll, I'll try and dive into a bit of that. But you know, we, we looked at the, the overall opportunity here and we realized like we have the seventh most arable land in the world. We're a country of innovators, that was true I was true 20 years ago with BlackBerry being our most valuable company, and this narrative worked a lot better before Shopify started to correct this year. But you know, last year, toward the end of the year, the most valuable company in Canada was Shopify. If you take these two things together, it's crazy that we lag so far behind when it comes to egg innovation investments. And, and even when you think about, you know, this is now more relevant data, it's this past year, there's $4.9 billion of capital deployed um, into ag tech in the US last year. And, you know, in the VC space, one of the first things we do when we're looking at a company is we think, you know, how big is the market of this opportunity? We're pretty lazy at what we do as well. So often we go, okay, it's about you know, one tenth the size of the US. We're about a tenth of the population. Generally balances out when you're looking at companies. If you can find you know, a defined market size in the US, it should be about a tenth here. So we should be at $490 million of, of capital deployed. I, I'd argue as well that 
you know, if you didn't take just the population approach of Canada being one tenth the size of the U.S., and you went into you know something like farmland, where we're about a fifth of the size of the U.S., which would be closer to a billion dollars in ag tech in, in venture capital deployed each year. Yet we're you know right here at the very bottom of the screen. You can barely see it. It's only 182 million dollars. So we're way off where we should be as a country when it comes to being at the forefront of innovation in the egg space and, and think we have a lot of opportunities that we can seize. As we kind of thought through how can we differentiate a fund, I really wish I got to speak before John so we sounded more innovative with this, but you know, the approach that Egg Capital Canada has done and what we've followed with afterwards as well is actually quite unique when you look at a lot of the egg tech funds in, in North America. Not a lot of them are built from the industry upwards, and we try to take that same approach where we've got lots of farmers invested in land, um, you know, egg retailers invested in the fund, um, you know, agronomists invested in the fund, equipment manufacturers in the fund, you know, Viterra and Mosaics, large international brands are invested in the fund. And the idea was, can we build a fund from the industry upwards, similar to what Egg Capital Canada has done here in Southwestern Ontario, where when we're sitting down and talking to a founder, we can actually put them in touch with our LPs to get you know, potential customers, partners, and get us feedback as well as we're looking at making these investments. And it was all to you know, correct this challenge we have where we have a high impact industry in agriculture that isn't being invested in from an innovation perspective. Um, so that's the first construct that we tried to build that we thought was a bit different, which is can we um, get the industry behind that? So we put together this fund. Uh, from the industry upwards. And the second was, can we get the investors to believe in a different style of playbook? The, the biggest difference that we see in the ag tech space for what makes the U.S. a lot better than us is how they capitalize their companies and how they invest in them. And, and I'll give you kind of a quick example of a company that we invested in through our first fund to show how that just wouldn't work through this iteration of how we're investing. So in our first fund, one of the um, initial investments we made is, was into a company called Salon Scale. It's a, a hardware software solution used at hair salons so you can understand the cost of color. Um, and instead of paying someone a base rate, you can pay someone when they're getting their hair colored. Sorry, I'm not an expert in this space, but well, I'll get into you know, what we were doing. You, you, could, you could charge someone based on the actual coloring product that they use. It's like my, my wife hates when I use this example because hair salons are different than uh, car mechanics, but it's you know, like separating parts and labor at, at a car when you're going to get your car done. That was the idea behind the company. Um, she was doing like, I don't know, two or 300 bucks a month in, in revenues, just getting off the ground. Met with the founder, Alicia Souye, who was exceptional and thought, holy smokes, she comes from the industry and the hair salon. She's been at the top of her industry as well. And we really think that, that she's onto something kind of interesting here. We gave her, I think it was $300,000, might have been $400,000, and uh, worked with her to continuously release our broken product, learn quickly on the fly, iterate fast, get user feedback, and try and build the product um, through this very kind of MVP approach. Fast forward today, and she's doing about $100,000 a month in revenue, is growing in a really kind of exciting way, and we're able to continuously take this scrappy approach to, to building the company. You can't really do that with egg tech. You know, like there's a reason you drive around in harvest season, everything's you know, red, yellow, or green. You, you need to have a reliable product that's commercially ready from day one. And that means you have to capitalize these companies at the earlier stages um, a lot more effectively. You need to be able to invest in them so they can build a product that's actually commercially ready. And you can't take this approach of let's get the you know, half done product out to the market and we'll figure it out as we go. Like farmers have, you know, 30 to 40 growing seasons in their career and, and a lot of them with you know a big part of their personal net worth at stake every year you know, there's a reason why they want products that are, that are reliable there's there's nothing um, backwards about their adoption methodology or, or how innovative they are they're some of the most innovative business owners in Canada and when you create something that adds value in an ROI rate away in a reliable way it gets adoption really quickly Your best example of this and it may not be on the farm operations, but we're seeing it in real time, particularly in the middle of Canada, is the adoption of Starlink. The amount of founder, or farmers that I know that are trying to grab Starlink as quickly as they can when it gets into their area. You know, they have something that they plug it in and it's ready and adds value right away. You know, these are people who, aren't, who want innovation to solve a problem. They just need it in a reliable way with a, you know, a quantifiable ROI. So that was the idea. Is can we build a fund from the industry upwards? Can we capitalize these companies so they can build a, um, you know, an effective product? And uh, you know, can we start to 
build ourselves out in the ecosystems across Canada. And this is the area that I don't think we're particularly good at right now. We need lots of help and, and would certainly love opportunities to engage with, with all of you as well. But you know, getting back to my initial point is ag tech will not just be a Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal thing. There won't just be you know, Saskatchewan plants their flag and says we now run ag tech. It's going to be you know, eight to a dozen ecosystems across Canada that need to be working in tandem and thriving together for us to be successful. And we got to figure out how we stitch all of that together. Selfishly, I'm saying that because then I get deal flow more effectively. But I think that for the, you know, the better of the, the whole country when it comes to the innovative ecosystem, we'd love to bounce ideas off of anyone here on how we can do a better job of stitching together you know, really strong collaborative ecosystems like you have here with what we're trying to build in Saskatchewan, with what's going on in, in the Maritimes, and, and really kind of creating everything in terms of a, uh, a more cohesive approach. Um, so we, we launched the fund. It's a $60 million fund launched towards the end of this year and have been actively investing since then. Um, the, the fund itself, as mentioned, it's, it's built by you know, farmers, retailers. We have lots of credit unions anchored in ag ecosystems across Canada. So in this area, Libro Credit Union is both an investor in our fund and you know, an active partner in helping try to get us integrated into the overall ecosystem. So as mentioned, I'll be you know, touring around with them in, I think it's the end of May, it might be early June but going in, you know, to each different accelerator in the area and, and partners and universities as we really try to figure out you know, how can we help Southwestern Ontario, how can we get you know, us more involved here, Ag Capital Canada more involved in Saskatchewan and really create you know, a lot of overlap in, in the ecosystems. Oh, and then the one anchor investor in our fund is Innovation SaaS. We took on $15 million, so a quarter of our fund from the province of Saskatchewan as we do, again, believe that that will be one of the, the formidable ecosystems in Canada as these kind of, you know, half a dozen, two dozen sprout up. Um, I just like to put this here, I got rejected a ton, so I just need to, every so often when I'm talking, I, when we're speaking with founders, I try to echo that we've earned the right to say no. We hate saying no, it still sucks. But I think our final list was 135 investors said no to us over the course of raising capital. I think it's a, a grueling stage, and for the founders, uh, in here, I would certainly say that you learn quickly as a venture capitalist and absolutely as a founder to have that get back up mentality where you know, you, all you need is those who say yes, and regardless of those who say no to you along the way, you know, certainly you have to be able to, to push that aside. So we have gotten to a state where we said, or we had a, a lot of investors say no to us and this idea that, that Canada can become an, an egg tech leader. Um, <clears throat> the other kind of unique point of our fund, how am I doing for time? The other kind of unique uh, perspective of our fund is we have our Emertech fund, so the $60 million venture capital fund with something like 55 investors in it, um, all centered around this thesis that we can make money investing in Canadian ag tech startups. But we also have this sister organization called Cultivator, which is uh, built out of Connexus Credit Union. That's an accelerator focused on ag tech. Um, the idea behind this accelerator is that It'll be an equity-backed accelerator. So anyone going into the program has received an investment from us. Um, some are our core investments that we made a direct investment to through the fund, like we did with IntelliCulture, who you'll hear from shortly. And others are founders that we think are really fascinating, building cool products in, in interesting spaces, but in areas that we may not be particularly strong. So Rob is a great example of that at Farm Health Guardian. You know, we think extremely highly of what they're building, love the idea. We're not really livestock experts. We figure let's get them into programming on super founder friendly terms um, where we're able to invest in them a small amount and work with them over a period of time to get to know more about their business. So these are the, the companies we've invested in across Canada. Um, in terms of those, those scout or, uh, or investments born out of the cultivator program, we have Eggvisor Pro, Livestock Water Recycling, um, Feed Flow, Farm Health Guardian, um, Chrysler Labs, and I think that's it for the ones we made through Scout Investments. We'll get into our, our core investments here in a second. Uh, the first four are ones that we've made kind of core investments into. So really, you know, a million dollars plus coming in on you know, commercial terms as, as we work with them. I'll skip over IntelliCulture because you get to hear from Cole shortly here, but Wicked Company. We, we love opportunities that add value to the farm operator today and have an end state that's really successful in the world of autonomous ag. I think that we, 
I don't know if we have the patience to say we're going to invest in a company that's going straight towards autonomous ag, and that's the whole live or die method for their company. We just, we're way too small of a fund to actually allow those companies to have the breathing room to get there. So we love it when there's a company that's taking those little baby steps towards autonomous ag, but is doing it in a way that has an ROI to the farmer today. I think IntelliCulture is a really good example of that, which we'll hear about shortly. Lucent Biosciences. So most of our fund will probably live and die at the intersection of software and hardware on the farm, but, but we're not afraid of doing stuff that's grounded in the real world. I think, you know, there's a, we talked to this one fund recently that's purely focused on, on software, and that's really challenging if you want to be an egg. It's tough to escape the actual real physical world in, in the egg space. But w one of the companies we invest in is called Lucent Biosciences, and they take the waste from uh, food processors, their first big partners with AGT Foods, uh, they take the cellulose fiber and they bind it to micronutrients to create a biostimulant fertilizer um, that they've, they've created. Really cool opportunity at the intersection of, of ag tech and clean tech that, that we think has a ton of potential here. And, and the initial uh, yields that they've been able to show through testing over the last couple of years have been particularly strong. Next one is Yuko Agro. I'm going to sound like a huge hypocrite here. I'm like, oh, it's like no Vancouver's in Toronto. Lucent was Vancouver and, and Yuko's Toronto. But Lucent's now actually moved all their operations to, to Saskatchewan as they started to see the, the opportunities that exist here. And, and Yuko's certainly been really active across Canada and the, um, the agriculture landscape. But Yuko, awesome founders who we've really been impressed with since we invested in them. Um, they take data predominantly from weather stations to draw insights on when a farmer should be applying specific crop inputs, largely in kind of the pesticide herbicide space. Really cool experience where we got to work with them for a while before we invested, understand how they kind of approach their go-to-market strategy. Um, it started off with saying, hey, we're going to plop this out, go sell it to farmers and say, hey, look at this app and we'll tell you when you spray your fields and this is how much you're going to pay us per acre uh, per year. And the farmers would say, no, I don't want to pay some nerds to tell me when I spray my fields. I go walk around and I know when I'm going to do this. They ended up actually finding their, their um, distribution method was the case towards traction for them, where now they partner with mostly retailers. The retailers go offer it, or their you know, independent agronomists go offer it to the farmers, and they include it into their overall kind of base fees. What it allows them to do is say, um, we now have insight into the entire area on when people will likely be spraying, and now we know when to you know, drive out there and go talk to them, when to make a call or when to try and sell products. It's become kind of an interesting way of informing retailers in different areas on how um, farmers are likely to behave based on all the data that's being generated. Again, largely through, um, largely through weather stations today, but they're piloting a whole bunch of other cool insights there. And then the last one, um, is Tech Brew Robotics based out of Sam and RMBC. So again, all these little ecosystems are gonna sprout up to create exciting companies. Uh, Mike Boudreau is the founder there, and they have created a robot that picks mushrooms. <clears throat> I didn't know much about mushrooms before entering into uh, diligence with them, but you know, they grow in these industrial facilities. Uh, they're super cold and humid and smelly and damp, and, and because of that, labor is a huge issue. In most places in the world, they solve the labor issue through temporary foreign workers, yet these industrial facilities are going all year round. So it doesn't really make any sense that you're constantly trying to uh, you know, infill with labor in a, a, an independent capacity. So it's a, a massive issue um, in terms of solving labor for mushroom farms. And the flip side of that is the robotics function of it's really difficult too. These mushrooms grow you know, extremely fast uh, over you know, hours, they, they get bigger and bigger. And they've created a cool robot that essentially scans the bed of the mushrooms, identifies which mushrooms are ready to be picked, and then plucks them out. And even then, they're really delicate. They're far more delicate than even a tomato. So you've got to pick them in a way that doesn't bruise or split them, you know, chop their stem properly, and, uh, and then you know, get them ready for packaging. So really cool company based out of small town BC that, that we think has a ton of potential uh, innovating at the intersection of, of robotics and, and controlled agriculture. Um, I think that a lot of ours, most of our investments have a common theme that we think is really interesting. This is an article that, that uh, Kyle and I, so Kyle runs the two funds with me, that we wrote um, a couple months back where you know, we think one of the biggest opportunities we have here in Canada is at the intersection of ag tech and clean tech. Um, you know, Canada has tried to be a leader in clean tech for a while, and we've, we've actually created some, some pretty exciting outputs there. 
But we've often spent a lot of money funding things that have a difficult business case without you know, the proper government tailwinds that can support it through subsidies and areas there. I'm trying to be delicate because I like all those initiatives. They are great. But the cool part about egg tech and clean tech is you're solving a problem of just how do I save the farmer money? You know, how do I reduce their amount of fuel they need or fertilizer they need or, or pesticides that they need? And all of those move directly into a great narrative around what you can be doing for, for the environment itself. You know, that's an opportunity that we think um, warrants a lot of attention. It looks like SDT, Sustainable De Development Technologies Canada, is also starting to look at these opportunities too. So for those in the you know, investment space in here, you know, I'm really excited about what the next decade holds for more clean tech, ag tech intersections and opportunities when it comes to collaboration. Um, the other kind of stuff that we're looking at right now is there's a lot of noise going on. Like we, we launched our first fund a little bit before the pandemic. You know, now there's the pandemic's coming to the end and there's a war. My, my mentor, um, again, I come from the operating background, so I'm, I'm new to the venture capital space and in, in the grand scheme of things. And a mentor of mine, his name's Neil Dempsey. He runs Bay Partners. Like his first investment was Starbucks. He's returned over a billion dollars back to his, his LPs over the years. And so I touch base with him once a month just to kind of keep my head on straight. And he put things in perspective, which is nice and, and kind of comforting for rookie VCs like me, is that we're in uncharted territory. Like there's, there's no amount of experience that navigates from a pandemic into a war and what that means for, for the impact on, you know, what interest rates means for the impact on the tech space. So, so I think that we're all kind of navigating this together, but certainly think that as we think through what the impacts could be, we're obviously gonna see a huge lift um, in Canada when it comes to the overall performance of the agriculture sector if there continues to be strain for a while, but certainly a, a new focus again on some of the uh, ideas that we heard from panelists this morning on how do, we, um, how do we better control the supply chain or understand it in a global sense and how does the tech space feed into that. All the while, as we kind of navigate those challenges, um, the tech market's actually falling apart. This is a bit dated now. It's actually gone much worse to start the year, but you know, we were in a wonderful space to end last year, and it's just been a downward spiral ever since in terms of performance in the public sphere for technology stocks. We've got egg is really interesting and taking off, but the NASDAQ is falling apart and all these tech companies are falling apart. You know, what the heck does that mean in terms of down, uh, downstream impacts in the private space? You know, I think that we're going to see these... Um, you know, multiple factors coming into ag tech over the next year and a half that all have us thinking something very different and how we can collectively as investors navigate the noise there so that our companies can stay growing, that they can stay well capitalized, but still have some sort of control over their own destiny. That is an area that we are starting to talk with a lot of our founders that are a bit further along. So mostly the ones in our first fund saying, you know, we should start thinking about do we want to target cash flow neutral or cash flow positive states? Is that an area that we want to at least know what those levers are um, if we think the world's about to fall apart, that we can manage them on, on a relatively consistent scale? I think that we're already seeing you know, some of these challenges when it comes to rising interest rates. The 10,000-foot the view for rising interest rates in tech is that Low interest rate environments are great for technology stocks because the whole idea of tech, tech is that the company is growing a lot, so you're betting on their future revenue state. So in five years, they're going to be doing this for revenue. That starts to erode in a higher interest rate environment because the future dollars are now worth less. So that's the 10,000-foot view for why the markets suddenly go insane when they, you know, interest rates rise by half a percentage. I think it's... Um, a massive overcorrection so far from what I've seen this year, but still it, it shows a light into what we could be potentially be seeing for some years to come. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. I think I've ran out of time. And uh, um, I hope that was helpful to see kind of you know, how we're looking at the, the general tech space here. But again, I'll be back out lots. So if anyone ever wants to connect, we'd, we'd love to meet with them. Could we do one, one for a couple of questions if there's any questions for each other? Yeah, totally. A lot of co-ops in agriculture and again I don't know much about raising a fund or anything but I I know for example in Saskatchewan 680 farmers are are buying their own fertilizer mixing facility so 
Do you see a few, and, and apparently there's a lot of money out there and probably a lot of it's rural. Do you see a future of creating a fund that's based on a co-op model and might you, might you comment on that opportunity? Um, I, th I think perhaps, so the only downside there is you need someone who's super greedy at the helm of these funds because we put in you know, really long hours and have a selfish approach you know, to say that we're doing this purely for the own good. I'm, I'm doing this for the impact that it means to, to myself and my family. If you could figure out a way that you incentivize the decision makers, because you know, we only say yes to call it one out of every 50 to 100 companies. I don't know how you could recreate the cooperative model to incentivize the people with the investment decisions the right way, but I'm sure there's a way you could. Uh, like I haven't thought through what that would look like, but absolutely the value you would get on the flip side of that to your LP or to your portfolio companies would be tremendous. Like we've. We've got, I don't know, a few hundred thousand acres of farmland represented through our farmer base, and what that does for our founders is exceptional. Like imagine if that was two, three million acres and a whole bunch of people who had their own personal capital in. I think it's you know, definitely an interesting concept there. I just have to think about you know, how you have the right kind of uh, people at the helm who are also taking on risk for, for a certain reward just because of you know, how grueling this industry can be. Thanks, Sean. Other questions, anybody else? Yeah, good question. So typical deal size will be kind of one and a half to three and a half million dollars um, at the earlier stages. We'll do a couple late stage companies. So there's one that we can't quite announce yet, but it'll be you know, one of the larger private deals in the ag tech space in Canada that we're, we're heads down working on. And the reason we do that, we did this with a company called Thinkific in our first fund too, is we've got a lot of people who've never invested in venture capital funds before. They all sign up at the start saying, yeah, we get it. It's going to take you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 years, whatever, to you know, fully realize our capital back. You know, after a couple of years, you start getting those phone calls. So it's nice if you can have something that turns around in a shortish period of time to show them, like, it's OK. We know what we're doing. Give us a bit of time. We'll figure this out. Uh, that's why we'll sprinkle in a couple later stage companies at the Series B or Beyond stage, because they have that ability to, to turn liquidity around faster. But most of the fund will be you know, one to three and a half million dollars at the seed stage. Thanks, Joe. Maggie? Thanks. Hi, great presentation. Thank you for sharing all this. Um, I think there's a little elephant in the room, and I, I probably everyone here knows um, about Farmer's Edge. Wondering if you could comment <sighs> as to what they did wrong or why they went from the, you know. Could we turn the cameras off? <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah, I'll be delicate with this. It's it's uh, a, an awful thing for the ag tech space for in, here in Canada, for them to be you know, one of the companies that IPO'd last year. Right as we're all talking about ag tech's great, and of course now they're 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 really struggling. You know, I think that um, through and through, when you're making an investment or when you're operating a company, your fundamentals have to make sense. And I know this sounds really kind of grade schoolish, but like. How much does it cost to acquire a customer and how quickly do you get that paid back and what are they worth over the long term and do they stick around? Like, do they not leave after a certain period of time? I think it was really at the core foundation where, where I think they're, they're still trying to figure things out. Um, you know, lots of neat opportunities that they're building there uh, when it comes to trying to drive you know, the future of, of agriculture and precision ag. Um, but I just don't know if they've really figured out how to acquire customers that want to stick around and keep paying them. So I, I, I don't know the company a ton. I haven't do dove into them, but from the 10,000 foot view on what you see on their public metrics, they've got holes in their boat that they just need to plug before. It's tough to keep scaling when, when you've got you know, big holes in the back of the boat. I think that you have to look at the investors of Farmer's Edge and what you think they would have wanted out of it going public at that point. And I think that'll tell some of the story there and not all yeah. comment on it, so yeah. yeah. It was, it was, a, it was the, a great time to take a, a company that may still be struggling public. You know, the markets went bonkers last year. They were one of the last ones who were able to run out there. I don't know if it actually worked out from a liquidity standpoint, but John's right. You know, timing was always a bit sus suspicious. You want to see companies go public when they've really figured it out, right? Like, we are now ready to raise a whole whack of money because we got this going and we can drive things forward. Not when they still have, you know, a few kind of core things they need to, to fix with their business. 
Yeah, uh, it's been mentioned a couple times today, just the um, importance of in getting to know the, the founding team and, and what you're investing in at this sort of stage of companies. How do you, or do you have any suggestions on strategies and tactics and best ways to do that given the socially distant world we've been in the last couple of years? Yeah, you know, I'd say um, get out of the socially distant world if, if you can as quickly as possible. You know, I've been a miserable investor during COVID. A lot of the deals we were made are already with founders that we knew. And even then, you know, like with Intelliculture, Kyle was like, hey, I'm ready to go. I was like, I'm not. I haven't met these guys. What are you talking about? So I had to jump on a plane and go out for supper with them at least to you know, get to know the, the teams that you're investing in. So I don't have great exa- great advice, unfortunately, when it comes to that because I think that seed stage investing is still so important in understanding the people and vice versa. Like that, you need to make sure that you really want to work with the, the founders too. You know, the, the fastest way to, to get that working in your side is to have really good underlying metrics, which is not going to be the case at the seed stage. Um, and then you know, what I would say is we need to start getting better at here in Canada at running fundraising processes a lot more effectively. And this sounds, I'll try and condense this because you know, Rob and Cole have heard me blabber on about this far too many times. But you know, I think in Canada, we start, a founder's like, hey, I want to raise money. I'm going to go say I'm raising money now. And I'm going to reach out to, to John Lansink and talk to him. And John takes a look at it and he goes, oh, okay, cool. I'm going to call Sean and see what he thinks. And he calls us and we've never spoken before. And you know, you're only talking to the one investor. That investor loses conviction and uh, you know, says, you know what, maybe now is not the right time. And then a month later, you finally track me down. And I go, oh, I think I heard about you from John a month ago. And then I call John. And he goes, oh, yeah, no, we're out. And you, we don't time things properly and run a process effectively. We need to create competitive tension. You know, people like John and I, we're all terrified all the time. We build conviction with each other. We like to bounce ideas off each other. I think that those are states where founders need to gate their process more effectively so that you build your list you talk to a whole bunch of investors ahead of time. You say, look, I'm not raising money right now, but we're doing all these cool things. I'm going to raise money once I hit this milestone uh, in the future. And it's a milestone you already know you're going to hit. Maybe you've already hit it already. But what you're trying to do is talk to all of us, get us hyped up. We're not asking us to evaluate you as an investment right now, but you're asking us to think about, you know, what are the cool upsides of this business? And don't worry, they're not even raising money right now. He's going to reach out in the future. Or she's going to reach out in the future when she's got you know, the milestones that's ready to show. She's ready to continue scaling. And then what that does is you've gated us all. So none of us are you know, attacking your business from all angles yet. And then finally, when you've got all of us excited, then you open the gates and you have all those meetings within a two-week period of time. And we're calling each other and you see all this momentum build up really quickly. Like they've nailed that process in the US where you have these like hot lightning rounds where everyone's like, holy smokes, that round was oversubscribed in 24 hours. Like, no, it wasn't. That was a six-month process they built on talking to investors and getting them prepped and constantly saying, I'm not raising. Stop trying to offer me a term sheet. I'm not raising right now. You know, I think that for the advice that I have here in Canada is founders need to do a better job of creating you know, a positive echo chamber around them, and that comes from gating your fundraising process more effectively. Sorry, I don't think I answered that question properly. But. Yeah, we probably have a chance for one last question. This may, may not be the right question to end on, but you said something that kind of triggered me, and that was a founder-friendly term sheet. So what's the structure of the deals that you do? Are they... Are they so our, our core investments are just commercial terms. We're trying to make money. We're trying to make the company successful. But for our, like, scout investments there, I think, Rob, was ours an uncapped note? Or do we have a cap attached to it? I forget. Like, it was... Yeah, we, we gave you know, money out to super high caps on a safe note or convertible note, whatever the founder wanted. Some were completely uncapped because we thought they would raise capital at some time in the next year. Those are, you know, the goal of those smaller checks through the cultivator program is to get money out that we think will turn into about a dollar for dollar in the future, but graduate a couple investments into the core fund. The core fund there, you know, when it comes to founder friendly, it still is, you know, guides the ethos of our entire fund. The things that are important for us is, you know, seed stage, when we're investing at the earlier stages, we really like the founders to continue controlling the board, but we want a board put in place. So we say, give us a board seat, give us one out of three seats. You can keep two of them. So at least you can tell us no and you can outvote us whenever you want, but let's put some structure in place. I've seen far too many times you go from seed to series A, and that Series A, holy smokes, I've lost my company, and now i got to deal with all this board that I've never done before. So we like to put that base structure in place. 
Um, and then certainly avoid any sort of crazy uh, you know, non-standard CVCA terms. You know, the most, I guess, investor-friendly investor, investor -friendly approach that we take is we take a 1x liquidation preference, which for those in the room, it just means that we want our money back before common shareholders get their money back. It protects you in the scenario that you invest at a you know, $15 million valuation to a company. They're super exciting and it's awesome. And then 12 months later, they sell for $10 million and you lose money on that. Um, so the founders can you know, pocket millions of dollars. All it does in that scenario is it gives you your money back before they get paid out. So that'd be the, the kind of non-founder friendly term that we think is relatively standard that we include. So once again, Sean, thanks so much for joining us. Um, you know, we're a little biased as we're all set in the room here together with an event space of all things that we are so excited that you said, get out, get boots on the ground and, and get together and start to meet people. But the one resounding piece that I think uh, we all heard through that is the importance of people and the importance of building and, and making those connections. And um, you heard Sean ask for help and support from this room. And we started when we started the agenda today to look for items of action. So um, there is no better time really than now, but please let him eat. We do also have a, a structured networking uh, session from four till five today, but we are, um, we are going to take some time right now and we're gonna break for lunch. Um, my amazing colleagues at the, the back of the room, uh, Danny and the, the culinary team are gonna invite tables to come, it is buffet style. And uh, we will back, be back to you here at about 1.20, so enjoy your lunch. <laughs>